Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Ryan Rucco, ESPN Radio, Yes Network. Ryan, it's Ryan and Scott. How are you doing? I'm great, man. Thank you guys for having me. Of course. Thanks for taking the time out. How was San Fran? You know what? I'm still here cause, uh, because I'm, I'm headed to uh, uh, Portland for my game on Wednesday. It didn't make sense for me to go all the way back east just to come back west. So um, it's beautiful, man. First of all, the weather has just gotten nicer and nicer every single day. Yep. Today it's like 84, which is the warmest day they've had in months. Um, and, uh, and the weather for the Super Bowl, especially like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, was spectacular. It's a great city. It's a great city even without an event like the Super Bowl, but it was it did such an amazing job uh, hosting this event. I'm lucky enough that I've been to quite a few Super Bowls and gotten to see you know which cities are great for it, which ones maybe aren't so great for it, and and this one is certainly uh, certainly one that should should be getting another Super Bowl as soon as they can. So. Talking about the Super Bowl here, we heard that it was about 80-20 Broncos fans out there. That, what, that's what Drew said. That's what Drew Casey said. Yeah. Said so what was the atmosphere like in, in the stadium yesterday during everything? Yeah, no, it was definitely somewhere around there. It was somewhere at 80-20, 70-30, something like that. And, you know, you, you kind of expect that a little bit when you're dealing with a team that is geographically so much closer, like Denver is with San Francisco. Um, and then also a franchise that's got so much more history. Um, you know, I mean, if you think about uh, who the Panthers are drawing in to their fan base besides the people who live there, um, you know, they don't have as many years to have done that. And uh, you need stars in order to do that. And, and in their case, they have Cam now. And so I think you do have some people who have become Panthers fans or who root for the Panthers because of Cam because he's such a big star. But, you know, even his stardom, has just reached a new level this year. You know, it'll be interesting to see how much more that fan base might grow in the next five, six, seven years as Cam continues to play in his prime. The Denver is obviously a long established, uh, successful franchise. And then you have the whole Peyton Manning crowd, which, uh, you know, is, is incredibly uh, plentiful after his, you know, near two decades of excellence. So he, I knew it was going to be an uphill climb, and it was. You know, they, uh, that's probably about the right percentage i'd say you know somewhere in between 70 30 80 20 so there was certainly a lot more noise when cam newton was waiting to take a snap than when peyton is and what's so interesting about that is you know a, a lot of times because there's a split in the crowd you don't necessarily have a uh, a disruptive noise to you know quarterbacks yeah. Peyton. but peyton's last two super bowl losses the one in miami against the saints Right. And then the one uh, at Giant Stadium or MetLife Stadium against the uh, Bronco. I mean, that's the the Seahawks. The fans of New Orleans and the fans of Seattle were two of the most rabid, loud fan bases I've ever heard at a Super Bowl. So they really made it feel like when they were operating their offense, Peyton and then the Broncos or, or the Colts in the first one against the Saints, like it was a road game. Yeah. And if you remember, it was sort of a story the last Super Bowl when Peyton lost in New York because they didn't practice with crowd noise. And remember early on the snap goes over his head mm -hmm. and they have a safety, safety, one of the first plays of the game, you know. And and this year Peyton Manning insisted that they practice with crowd noise That's so smart. that they could counteract that sort of scenario. And, you know, as it turned out, he didn't have to deal with anything like what he dealt with crowd wise with the crazy, amazing Saints and Seahawks fans. But uh, I, it's just interesting because the crowd dynamics are always sort of an unknown variable right. in a Super Bowl, whereas when you're going into a road venue or you're playing home, you know exactly what it's going to be like. Yeah, right, exactly. You brought up Kate, uh, Peyton Manning. Was last night his last game in your mind, and do you think it should be his last game? Yes and yes. Uh, I mean, it, you know, I'm a huge Peyton Manning fan. He's been one of my favorite players for a very, very long time. It's hard to watch right now, you know, seeing – you know, a more or less impotent version of him uh, when you compare him to what we saw for his entire career. I mean, this is a Peyton Manning that, you know, <laughs> basically redefined the quarterback position, and now he can just sort of lob his way down the field. Yeah. I, think, I think his contributions were actually a little underrated when you take a look at the very end of the regular season once he replaced Brock Osweiler 
and then the, the first two playoff games heading into yesterday. But, I mean, clearly he didn't play a good game yesterday. He just kind of adopted the mentality he had to with this group, which was don't try and do too much, you know. I mean, I think yeah. there were times in his career where on the big stage he probably, you know, felt like he had to do a little too much and force some things, and he sort of learned with this group that that wasn't the way to be and give him credit for completely changing his mentality and, and you know, adopting exactly what needed to be. It's almost like the opposite of what... Uh, people are criticizing Kobe Bryant for right now, right? Like, hey, dude, yeah. like, you know, it's not the time for you to take 25 shots anymore. I love Kobe, by the way, but, you know, <laughs> he, he, but yeah. with Peyton, it's sort of like he, he understood it's not the time to take 25 shots anymore, right? It's the time to take yeah, yeah. It's, eight, it, it, eight shots and let the rest of the team do their work. I, I feel like you've never had to hold your breath when Peyton throws a ball, but this whole season, yeah. it's like you had to, like, yeah. you were that's, short of breath every right. time he had to drop back. That, yeah, that's the perfect description, actually, man. It really is. Every time he throws, you're like, oh, what's going to happen here? Which is not the way you should feel for perhaps the greatest quarterback of all time. So give him credit. He's over 500 now in his postseason career. He's him. the only quarterback to win Super Bowls with two different teams. Um, and uh, he sort of can partially dispel the postseason struggles narrative now that he has two titles. But clearly he's a shell of the amazing quarterback he was. And you only want to be that diminished version of yourself for but so long so that it doesn't, you know, in any way curb into the memory of, of what was, in my opinion, the single most dominant uh, franchise influencer as far as players go in the history of the NFL. Yeah, so now now f- f- flipping teams, Cam Newton frustrated the entire game. You could see it on the field, on the sidelines, and we saw it in the press conference. What do you make of him leaving that press conference? Well, yeah, first of all, did you guys see? I, I felt like his body language during the game was awful. We just said um, that. We said that. We very said lackluster. That. Yeah. Very, I thought he was going to come out flipping out. He was just, he didn't seem the cam we saw all season. Yeah. Well, and before the game, one of the things I thought was awesome was, like, right before kickoff, he was down. The Broncos were getting ready to receive. Cam had run down the sideline. I don't know if you, like, I, I was fortunate enough to be at the game yesterday, and this was sort of on my side of the field where I was sitting. He had run down, I don't know if they showed it on TV, like into the end zone, was like getting the crowd going, his Panther fans mm-hmm. going as the Broncos were getting ready to receive the kick. And I was like, wow, when do you see like another team like on the field getting ready and the opposing quarterback, who's not even about to be on offense, is like riling up the troops, and I thought it was awesome. Yeah. And, you know, when they scored their one touchdown, he was he was fired up. But for the most part, he looked uh, a little shocked. And, and, you know, I guess that Denver defense can do that to anyone. But it's more jarring when you go from someone who is so gregarious and so energetic and then see them look so dejected, you know? I mean, if it's Eli Manning and he has the same body language that Cam did yesterday, it doesn't feel like that big a swing, you know? Um, yeah. if, it, if, it's, if it's Russell Wilson and he has the kind of body language he did yesterday, you know, although Wilson certainly can be, uh, uh, you know, fiery at times, like, it, it, there's, it wouldn't feel like that big a swing. But for Cam, he is such a lightning rod, such a spark plug. To see him looking, you know, as dazed and confused as he did was sort of alarming and jarring. And, and even in the final drive, you know, you're down two touchdowns. There's, you know, a minute left. You're not going to win. But, like, he's, like, walking to the line of scrimmage and all that. I, I just thought, you know, he it was almost like he knew what was happening. Right and had seen enough, you know, and, and, and it, it, yeah. it reminded me a little bit, and this is not necessarily a, a fair comparison, it's just something visually that it reminded me of, like sometimes when LeBron James gets in a huge game and he just knows it's not happening, like he can, he'll kind of like shut it down and hang on the perimeter a little bit, and like, I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago in the finals, like game five against the uh, Spurs, when the Spurs just absolutely ramrodded the heat in that series, in the beginning of the game, LeBron came out amazing. It was a beast in the first quarter. And then, like, as the game went on, he just sort of realized, like, there was no chance his team was going to do this. And so, basically, right. he went, like, eight minutes in the third quarter, like, not touching the basketball, just kind of, like, almost resigned to what was going to happen, you know? It, it felt that way a little bit at times yesterday with Cam. Like, he was getting hit so much. I wonder if he almost was, like, resigned to the fact that, like, his guys couldn't block them, you know? Um as far as his post game stuff, like I wasn't the best loser playing sports growing up. I was always an upset 
um, person, but I thought like Steve Young <laughs> had the had the best, uh, and that was on a obviously a much lower level I, where I never had to answer a single question to the media. Right. Um, but I thought Steve Young had a good explanation of it. Like, is it the you know worst thing? And no, it's not. Like you're you're upset. You just lost huge game. However, when you will have the kind of personality where you are, um, you know, going to be into the histrionics and and into such you know flagrant celebrations when things are going good, you, and then you act that way when things are going yeah. bad and they don't go well. Ryan literally just said that literally ten minutes ago. You know, <laughs> you just opened yourself up to that criticism. That's right. all. I mean, if you sign with that, that's fine. But you know, I don't think it's unreasonable to feel like, hey, man, you got to give a little bit more. The rest of your team is mm-hmm. going to, you know, you you got to. You got to give a little bit more uh, after the game, just uh, just for the sake of of being. If you're going to be the man, you're going to be the face of the franchise, and, and even the face of the league. You, you need to maybe handle defeat a little differently. Right, exactly. Great point. We're right here on Beast of the East WRPR ninety point three FM with Ryan Rucco. Ryan, let's get into you and your career now. Describe the journey from Fordham and WFUV to now. Yankees play-by-play, Nets play-by-play, ESPN play-by-play. You're doing it all. Describe the journey. I'm lucky, man. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm very blessed. I have like the most amazing support system ever. Like I always say that instead of having to try and prove people wrong, I've always just had to try and prove people right. I, I my you know my my parents taught me. From the time I was really little, I could do anything I wanted to. You know, my sister's one of my best friends. Like, I have the most awesome aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents, and my friends are amazing. So, like, I've always had confidence that I could do, you know, whatever I wanted to do. So I didn't have to necessarily um, get over uh, people around me doubting. Instead, it was feeling always supported, which is huge in anything you do, and especially if you're going to do something where you're open to, uh, you know, public criticism because people are observing your work whatever that may be whether it's being the quarterback of an NFL team or a radio host right or a play-by-play guy um but you know I Fordham was amazing for me I know you guys have a great program there as well I believe my buddy Don LaGreca he's, yes he's, 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 he's by the way oh, yes. by the way thank you very much for that shout out you probably don't remember it, but about a year ago you Don and Michael gave us a huge shout out while we were down with the air. So without you guys, mm-hmm. we, we wouldn't even be here right now. So we just want to thank you a lot because hey, without man. that, we're not here. It's important what you guys are doing. So we're happy to help, man. I mean, that's how you get better. It's about the reps, you know. And my mentality always was, if you crack the door open for me, I'll kick it down. And I was, you know, you have to have people crack the door though. And I was lucky enough to. And then you just try and with each opportunity, you know, prove. Uh, that you are, you know, worth that that chance and that opportunity. And, you know, I've been able to do that. I've had a lot of, you know, companies and bosses give me those chances. And it's just, you know, it's it's preparation, you know, for every assignment. I don't care whether it's a demo of a, uh, a, you know, a local game you're doing, you know, for Ramapo women's basketball or if it's, you know, an NBA playoff game on ESPN. The preparation you do for each game and the care you take with each assignment has to be exactly the same because you never know who's listening, and it's the only way you're really going to get better. That's a really good point right there. All right. Speaking of basketball, and ba- actually, we'll stick with basketball. You've been around the Nets a long time. What is wrong with them? To put it put it plainly, what is wrong with them? I have no idea how to work. You guys tell I'm already long-winded. Do you really want to ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's, I think where it starts is, sort of the conscious decision to, um, to that they felt like they needed to be really good right at the start of Brooklyn and have something that people would want to watch um, and come back for. And it probably get, guided them in a position, in a place to make decisions that weren't in the best interest for a sustainable future for the franchise, you know whether it was dealing for a Joe Johnson, although I don't think that deal is actually as bad as people think because they really didn't give up any players um, and Joe was a really good player for them. Um, or, you know, Gerald Wallace type deal, obviously the Celtics trade. They, they sort of constantly made decisions that were focused around being good as soon as they moved in. And that submarined the ability to build a sustainable product. Where they are now, 
they just don't have that many good players. You know, I mean, it's as simple as that. Thaddeus Young and Brooke Lopez is a reputable starting front court on a playoff NBA team. But other than that, you know, Rondé Hollis Jefferson is promising, but obviously he's been hurt for a long time. You know, uh, having Shane Larkin and Donald Sloan, even though Donald Sloan's played well of late, as your starting point guard, thanks to Jared Jack's injury, or your, you know, point guard rotation. I mean, that's not, that's just not, you know, that's not NBA caliber for a winning team. We all know that, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a couple of, uh, you know, it's one guy who's bounced around multiple teams. It's another guy who's an undrafted journeyman. Um, and uh, in the NBA, it's just not going to get it done. I mean, if you look at their bench, you know, their starters have actually been able to put together some decent numbers, but their bench is full of guys who maybe should be on NBA rosters mm-hmm. right now, maybe shouldn't, and instead they're receiving extended minutes. Um, and so it makes it difficult. You know, I think it feels like they're about to make the right decisions when it comes to who they're going to put in charge next to lead their program. Yeah, And I think that that should give us some confidence with where they can go from here. But, you know, uh, as of right now, obviously there hasn't been a ton of sustainability on that front either. Uh, you know, you've gone through uh, countless head coaches in a short period of time. It's just hard to build that way. So hopefully they make, you know, a prudent hire a GM and then uh, somebody who works well with the GM as their head coach and can kind of use that as a long-term stability. You know, you're not always going to hit a home run, but, but let's just take Boston, for example with the hiring of Brad Stevens. Yeah. Where you give him a six-year deal, you know he's your guy, and you're not worried about winning right away in year one. You're worried about building something that you think can be good for 10 years, you know? It, it starts with hiring the right people. It feels like ownership is making a really concerted effort to go through a thorough and, and precise process to hire those right people, and that has me encouraged. But until you hire them, you're going to continue end up seeing problems like you've had so hopefully they hire those people now all right now now switching over to baseball talking about a gm brian cashman doing a great job in the offseason keeping his young guys but getting starling castro getting all this chapman we're excited for this season how excited are you oh man i'm pumped um i mean i always get excited for baseball season and for the yankees of course but uh, i'm excited to see the back end of that bullpen i'm excited to see um Starlin Castro and Didi Gregorius is a middle infield combo. You no, know, I think this team has its fair share of issues that you're going to have to work through. I certainly think that you know you have serious question marks um, with you know what's happened with Greg Bird going down, and now what's going to happen if A. Rod and Teixeira are either hurt or don't produce like they did last year. Mm-hmm. Um, because more than anything else, I know people focus on the rotation and they talk about the total number of runs, but the second half of last year, the Yankees were a really bad offensive team. And so if they're not getting that kind of production from Tex and A-Rod, they will once again not be a good offensive team. So how do they supplement the runs they need? Is it a bounce back year from Ellsbury? Is it Gardner somehow figuring out how not to wilt in the second half after tremendous first half? Um, but the back end of the bullpen itself, I think, is going to be fun to watch, guys. And I think that could be their equalizer to steal enough games to make it an interesting season. Yeah, you just have to tell your your pitchers, just give me six. Yep. Please just give me six. Maybe right, maybe even right. five. So. No, I mean, I mean, it could, depending on the game and the importance, it could just be five totally. Mm-hmm. All right, before we let you go, we already know your favorite rapper of all time is Eminem, <laughs> but I need to know two things. Okay. Your favorite rap song of all time, and if you had to choose between two, what are you watching? The two Pitch Perfect movies or the Star Wars series? Oh, man. <laughs> I, like, I might pull a cam on you and just bounce. Uh, this is like the toughest questions I've ever been asked. Um, Good. That was know, my goal. <laughs> my, my favorite. So, hmm, my it's, favorite it's so hard. Like, it is hard. rap song of all time would probably be uh, Lose Yourself, even though that's so typical, and I hate being like a diehard Eminem fan and then going to like his biggest commercial song, but it's just so good. Um, <laughs> I don't, but, but if it was favorite, like of any song, it actually would probably be All For You by Sister Hazel. I just love that song, and my, my friends and I would always play it at every like party in college, and we still do to this day. Like, Not once bad. everybody was there. We would all like play that song and then sing it together. So it's, I think it's wonderful for the year and also equally nostalgic for me. Uh, but 
as far as the other question goes, you got to pick man, it. Man, I, I love Anna Kendrick. I mean, I love her, <laughs> but I love Darth Vader even more. So I'd have to go Star Wars. Wow. Uh, you'd have to. I, I just, I just watched all, all of them, and including the, the newest one over this past winter break. And I, I'd have. Can you to watch say, them in like a day? I watched. I watched <laughs> the the series in two days, and then I went to see the oh, new one God. that night. And was the first time you had seen them? First time ever. I've wow. owned them for over six, seven years, and I never touched them. Well, and what I were you ju- thinking? Well, well, Ryan over here is saying I'm it was not worth. Inter- I'm not it interested. Was not worth I'm my not time. Interested. Oh, dude, you gotta get interested. <laughs> oh, like, it is. It is. It's, they're so good. Here's the thing. I'm not like a sci-fi right, guy. Con- convince you know? me. Convince <laughs> yeah. me. I'm not a sci-fi guy. I really am not. Like I'm not. And, like, and neither I am I. That, into, that's I why I never watched into, them. Right. Exactly. Because you thought it was sci-fi, and then you realize it's not sci-fi at all. It's not like Alien or X Files or Star Trek. It's not like that at all. It's, it's a story about. It's really like coming of age, like interpersonal connective stories. You know, like it, it really is. Like if you think about shows you watch growing up, like a. You know, I, I'm just going to throw out some examples. Save like a Bell, One Tree Boy Hill, Meets World. All right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy Meets World, like all that. It's kind of like that, but with, you know, more, you know, uh, you know, tough characters, so to speak, and like shiny uniforms and yeah. bigger stakes. But like the reason you feel hooked is because of the characters, and it's funny and humorous. Man, you got to check it out. All right, I'll th- you got me on the pitch perfect a, a while ago, but uh, See? I'll take it into consideration. You've got to have well, universal trust of me at this point. When man. you All hear right. James Earl Jones' voice as, as Darth Vader, it's That's just, it's just it, come on. Yeah. See, you know. You, you're going to do the right no, thing. No, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll do that. Ryan, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring him up here, and I'll sit Ryan in front of the TV and make him watch him. Good. All right. If you don't you fail us off. All, All right. right. All right. <laughs> Ryan Rucco, thank you very much for joining us today. Keep doing your thing. Thanks you uh thank you for paving the way for the young broadcasters like Scott and me. We are huge fans of you. Again, thank you very much for coming on to the show. Well, thank you guys for the kind words and the support, man. You guys have a great day and keep grinding, all right? Thanks a lot you too. Take care, man.